Good morning, and welcome to the worship services of the Lord's Church. We gather together because we're of one mind. We have a common faith, we have a common purpose, we have a common hope. We have a common love for God and for one another. We are family. We're adopted by God our Father through the blood of his Son, Jesus the Christ. We come because this is what our Father has commanded us to do. Let us pray. Good morning. Uh, today is our, our, as our nation also takes an opportunity to celebrate moms everywhere, for moms to be, moms that are. Uh, we certainly appreciate all of our moms. I know I do. And so uh, let's pray to God today. Dear God, our Father in heaven, we humbly come before your throne this morning. We offer our thanks and our gratitude that you have still enabled us to be able to have our, our small gathering here, both in person and virtually, that we may continue to celebrate the Lord's Day. Lord God, we're thankful for the leadership up here. We're thankful for the members here that we continually look to Sunday as our, the start of our week, as a wonderful day to remember all that you've done for us. Lord, we're so thankful for the mothers in our lives. We're so thankful for the unceasing, the never wavering, continued work they do as we grow up as children. We're so thankful for their blessing. We're so thankful for their heart. We're so thankful for their nourishment that they've given us to help us also grow in your word. Lord, we're also <clears throat> mindful of those that are also having struggles this time. This may be due to lost jobs it may be to isolation and separation. And Lord, we, we ask that you help us to reach out, help those know that <clears throat> while we are physically separated, our communication can span across several different means. We can reach out, we can hold them virtually, we can talk to them and encourage them. Lord, we're also mindful of those with recent sadness in their life. Lord, we pray for Linda White and her family. We, play, we pray for Christy Clark, Stacy Hale, Kyle Whidden and their, their family, and their extended family, in the time of their loss. Lord, we also pray for others who are continually working through health issues. Lord, we pray that Dana Ritchie will have a very successful surgery tomorrow to ease some pain that she has had for a while, to make her better, to make her stronger. Lord, we, play, we pray for Glenna Peterson right now to have the strength and courage to continue to work through her health issues, to come back to us stronger than ever. Lord, we also would like to pray for the Simmons family. We would like to pray for the DeBerry family, the Brooke family, for others that may just need your healing hands above anything else we can do here, to guide them, to comfort them, to encourage them that you are indeed in control. Lord, as we continue through this service, we hope that you'll accept our <clears throat> service here. You'll be in tune with our hearts, our minds, 
will be on your word. And today, we again will be revived and be encouraged by knowing that you are in control. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen. The first song this morning will be, I love you, Lord. Do so. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul. Rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Next song will be We Will Glorify. Do me, we will glorify the King of kings, we will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of lords, who is the great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty, we will bow before His throne. We will worship Him in righteousness, we will worship him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe. All praise to him we give. Hallelujah to the King of kings. Hallelujah to the Lamb, hallelujah to the Lord of lords, who is the great I Am. Lord God Almighty. Do Spirit Almighty, living eternally, holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, Jesus Almighty, reigning in glory, holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, Father Almighty, loving with mercy, holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, Lord God Almighty, oh blessed Trinity, holy, holy, Lord God Almighty. 
This month, our reflections on the Lord's Supper have focused upon the reasons for the death of Jesus Christ. One of these reasons that we will cover today is that he died to establish a new covenant. In Matthew, the 26th chapter, verses 26 through 29, we read, Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat. This is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink it again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. By using the phrase, the blood of the covenant, Jesus harkens back to Exodus 24, when the Mosaic Covenant was established. In Exodus, the 24th chapter and verse 8, we read, And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Jesus says that this cup of the Lord's Supper foreshadows the shedding of his own blood and the absorbing of God's wrath, opening the way for the redemption of all people through the new covenant relationship that was promised in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34, which reads, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I remember their sins no more. This new covenant, established through the shedding of the blood of Christ, involves a transformation of the lives of its recipients by writing God's laws into their minds and hearts, and it brings true forgiveness of sins. Let us give thanks for the bread. Our Father and our God, we come to Thee thanking Thee for Jesus Christ. For Father, He came to this earth willingly, lovingly, obediently to do Thy will. He came to this earth to bring us hope, to defeat sin, to defeat death. And Father, because he offered a sinless sacrifice for us, a perfect sacrifice, we now are able to come to you in prayer, to come boldly before your throne. We now can gain the purification that we need from our sins. We thank thee, O God, for Jesus Christ. We thank thee for this bread which represents his body. As we partake of it, Father, we do so declaring our union with you, with your son, and with each other. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Let us give thanks for the cup. Lord God Almighty, we thank Thee for Jesus Christ. We thank Thee for His death on the cross. Father, there He shed His blood for us. This blood, we recognize, Father, the life is in the blood. And by Him giving His life, it allows us to live. By giving His blood, that purifies us, that cleanses us. And Father, we are so very grateful unto Thee. Thank Thee, Father, for this cup. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you will, take out your Bible and follow along this morning. We're going to be reading out of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. In the second letter to the Corinthians, Paul talks about having the light of the gospel. <clears throat> in verse 8, he mentions how we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. The scripture this morning hopefully encourage us and, and enlivens us to have, have good faith because the Lord is there. So Paul begins in verse 16. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Good morning, everyone. You're going to need your Bibles open to Ephesians 3, please. Ephesians chapter 3, we're going to be reading from that text in, in just a minute. Today is a good day. It's a great day. It's a great day because Jesus lives. And it's a great day because just as Brian read for us, when things don't seem good around us, uh, when the things in our life around us seem bleak, we look to that which is eternal, what we can't see with our eyes. And we remember that all the problems of today, all the issues of today are, are just but for a moment. They're short-lived. They just don't compare to where we're going. We're heaven-bound, and worship helps us remember where we're going. I hope you're doing great. I hope that your worship together as, as a family uh, at home has been a blessing to you today, and I hope that you are staying healthy and strong, that your faith continues to grow. Uh, I hope that wherever you are and however you are, that you are continuing to do well. You are in our thoughts and our prayers. You're in my thoughts and in my prayers. And I can't wait to see you soon. It's been a great morning here. My thanks to Brian and Brian Enos in the back for keeping us safe, for Carter and his songs, Terry, and reminding us of the glorious covenant we now have in Jesus who paid for it with his blood. My great thanks to Eric and Richard. They have been here 
about every week in the back, helping us do all that we've done. The past, I think, eight weeks now, they've been back here helping us, and we couldn't do it without them. They've offered their, their service and their sacrifice, and so I'm thankful for you, brothers, and all that you do for us. Today is Mother's Day, and I think one of the greatest blessings God gave to us is mothers. Uh, we couldn't do it without them. Their love, their sacrifice, their tender care, and their gentle instruction uh, mothers, you deserve much praise today, and so I hope that you were showered with blessings and that you know just how special you are to those in your lives. Tomorrow starts our gospel meeting, our virtual gospel meeting, and it will be Monday through Wednesday, 7 p.m. each night. Ricky and I will be right here. Uh, we'll both be on the stage, sitting in chairs, discussing together the life of Elijah. And uh, we, we did one practice round last week. I'm really excited. I'm, I'm really excited for the meeting. I'm excited to share with you what we have uh, studied and prepared through his life, through the life of Elijah. And it's just a blessing to, to be able to work with Ricky in, in such a, um, a unique way with this meeting. I'm just so blessed to work with him and to work alongside with him. And so that's starting tomorrow. Tune in with us tomorrow at 7 o'clock and we will we'll begin our meeting. And um, we hope it will be a blessing for you. Today, we're going to continue the series that we started for this month, and that is what I want you to know about Jesus. I mean, think about that. I mean, all the pages we could fill providing answers to that thought. What I want you to know about Jesus. Ricky did an incredible job last week starting the series for us. He took us to Hebrews 12. And you have to see that the, the motivation, the prompting, the, the, the reason for the way that we live, it's because of our pace setter, the author and finisher of our faith. It's because we're looking to Jesus. Our eyes are fixed on him. And so the reason that we think the way we think and speak the way we speak and do the things that we do is because we're trying to become more and more, more and more like him. Well, today I want to talk about the love of Jesus. You know, I, I just don't think you can talk about Jesus without talking about his love. There's a, a famous theologian named Karl Barth, and decades, decades ago, he was holding a, a famous seminar talking about deep things in the scripture. And during one of the breaks, he was approached by a, a student, a college student, and he was asked, Professor Barth, what is the greatest thought that you have ever thought? Isn't that a tough question? What's the greatest thought that's ever entered into your mind? Well, he stopped for a minute and he thought about it. And then he looked up and he said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. You know, something that's so true of all of us, of every person, something so fundamental written on our hearts is that everyone wants to be loved. Everyone wants to know that they are loved. Without it, without knowing that you are loved, we feel deplete of strength and a purpose, of confidence. We feel isolated and alone and defeated. But if you know that you're loved, if you know that there's someone who genuinely cares for you, there's not an army in the world that can withstand the strength and the confidence of one who knows that they have the love and support of someone, someone in their life. Now, all of us have known variations of love. Our mates, our parents, our children, our friends, our brethren— but as you see on the screen, it's all different. No one loves quite like Jesus loves. There's something different about the love of Jesus. How would you describe it? You know, if, if you were tackling this lesson and approaching this subject, how would you describe the love of Jesus? Well, you, you might use words like Jesus' word or Jesus' love. It's not based on merit. The love of Jesus is not based on merit. Do you remember the, the movie Beauty and the Beast, the Disney movie? It's a movie about a, a young prince who was arrogant and selfish and didn't care for anybody. And because of that, he was transformed into this, this hideous beast. Well, along the way in the movie, he encounters this girl named Belle. And at first she can't stand him. She doesn't like him. But she starts to show him kindness. She starts to show him compassion. And not long after, a transformation takes place. He doesn't turn back into a human. He's still a beast, but he starts to show kindness and compassion, starts to be selfless towards those in his life. Well, Chesterton, G.C. Chesterton, made this observation about Beauty and the Beast. He said, a thing must be loved in order for it to become lovable. 
A thing must be loved before it is, it is lovable. Now think about that. Who did Jesus show his love to when he was here on earth? Was it just the wealthy? Just the powerful? Was it just the prominence in Judea? Was it just the religious elite? Was it just those who, who had their lives all together? And we know that's not the case. We know that Jesus was criticized. One of the most common criticisms of Jesus is that he was spending time inviting to his, peop- into his table people who others felt were not worthwhile. It says in Matthew 9 and verse 10, that as it happened, as he was reclining at the table in the house, behold, many tax gatherers and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why is your teacher eating with the tax gatherers and sinners? But when Jesus, when he heard this, he said, it's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. Who was it? Who did Jesus spend his time with? Who was invited to his table? Who did Jesus shower his love upon? Well, see it, the broken, the desperate, the outcast, the isolated, the sinful, the immoral, the tax collectors, you might say the unlovable. But here's the thing, Do you, don't you see us here in this passage? Maybe Paul will make it a little more obvious when he says in Romans 5 and verse 6, while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Do you see us? That's us there. The blind, the ignorant, the selfish, the rebellious, completely undeserving, and yet fully receiving the amazing love of Jesus. Jesus' love is not based on merit. We might say that Jesus' love is demonstrated through sacrifice. You think of that, that special, well-known verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, what? He gave. He gave his only begotten son. Jesus' love is a giving love. Jesus' love is a forgiving love. Jesus' love is a boundless, sacrificial love. Jesus taught it. He modeled it. He proved it. He lived it by walking up Calvary's hill and dying for the sins of the world. You think about just before he entered into that garden, before he partook of that Lord's Supper, before he was betrayed in John 15, verse 13, Jesus says, greater love has no one than this, than a man would lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus laid down his life, not just for his friends, but for the world, for his enemies. We might say that Jesus' love is patient. You know, it's not short-lived. It's not quick, quick-tempered. You know, it's not something that lasts just for a moment. It's an enduring type of love. And you might ask, well, how do you see Jesus' love demonstrated through patience? Well, have you seen about the way he handled his apostles? I mean, how often did Jesus teach specifically to his 12 or give them specific, a specific parable or do a miracle in their presence and they completely miss the point? You know, I think about what's said in, in Mark 6, verse 52, that the apostles had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves, but their heart was hardened. Jesus feeds 5,000 people with the bare minimum scraps, and they didn't get a piece of it. They didn't get any of it because their hearts were hardened. And, you know, Jesus didn't say, get out of the boat. Get out. I'm going to be with other guys. You guys are just not getting it. What's wrong with you? No, he's very patient, long-suffering. You think about the people he taught. And the people he encountered, you think about the Pharisees and how long-suffering Jesus was and how he tried to teach and correct them. And you know, we might make the point, even us today, the reason we live today, the reason that we are still alive today, good brethren, is because God and Christ are being patient, not wanting anyone to perish. No, he's giving us one more day, one more day to get things right, one more day to turn from our sins, one more day to give our lives over to him. Hang on, Jesus, I'm not sending you yet. No, it's, it's a patient love, a long-suffering love. We might say that Jesus' love is kind. Jesus' love is kind. You know, if, if your picture of Jesus is of this cold, 
standoffish, isolated, uninterested individual. You just, you've got the wrong picture of Jesus. That's not the picture he's painted in the Gospels. You know, Jesus is the one who welcomed the kids among them. So when the apostles were trying to rebuke the children to coming near Jesus, he says, permit them to come to me. Do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. So here's the thing. When we're all back together and we're all in this assembly, if Jesus were here, you know where we'd see him? we see him right here sitting on the stage. He'd have our kids in his arms and he'd be smiling. That's Jesus. You know, it was Jesus. He could heal with his mouth. He could heal just by speaking it. But there were times, like when he came across the leper, he made a point of tenderly touching the man. I'm willing to be cleansed, the touch of kindness. You might remember when Jesus was rushing with Jairus to go and heal the synagogue official's daughter. They had to get home quick. They're on the way, and this woman who has this issue of blood reaches out and touches Jesus. He turns around to see her, and it says in Mark 5, 33, the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. In other words, she told her whole story. Jesus didn't say, I don't have time for this. You stole the miracle. Get out of the way. He stopped, and he let her share her whole story. Why? Because the love of Jesus is touched with warmth and compassion. Enough to where he would give his time and attention to those who might feel like, like they're just not worthwhile. That's our Jesus. We would say his love is very selfless. It's not arrogant. It's not self-centered or self-seeking. It doesn't boast about itself. No, it's selfless. It puts the needs of others before his own. And we see that with the Father. He came doing the will of the Father, not what he wanted to do, but what his Father wanted him to do, what his Father sent him to do. And so in that garden, the night he was betrayed, we remember that prayer when he says, remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, your will be done. Now, we know what this means. When he was praying, your will be done, what he was saying is, I'm going to accept your mission as my own. I'm going to finish. I'm going to complete what you sent me here to do. That's what Paul would describe in Ephesians 3 and verse 11, the eternal purpose realized in Christ Jesus. Now, stay with me for a minute. I want you to think about this. Eternal purpose realized in Christ Jesus. You know what that eternal purpose is? We call that the plan of redemption. That long ago, before the world was created, God had the plan that he's going to send his son to die on the cross and he was going to die for the sins of the whole world. That means you and me. It does. So think about this. Before the world began, Jesus was thinking about us. The manger, taking on flesh, Life under the sun, with all of its pains and its burdens, the trial and the arrest, the scourging, the robe, the crown of thorns, the cross, the nails. He had us in mind. Is Jesus saying, this is for you. This is for me. See, the Hebrew writer would say, the purpose, the plan that Jesus came to fulfill, that's for us. Since then the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might deliver those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Why did he come? For what purpose did he come? For whom did he come? This selfless love of Jesus put our needs before his own. And let me just take a quick tangent. We're going to get back to our story of love and our, our lesson on love. But look what he's saying here. He came to deliver us and to free us from this bondage of fear, subject to slavery and death. Here's the thing. Jesus came to set us free from fear. The ultimate fear was the ultimate penalty, the ultimate storm that we could not escape, the wrath for our sins, the wrath of God that we were facing, that we were destined to face because of our sins. He came and he took that away so that now 
even in death, there's a confidence, there's that blessed assurance of a hope of eternal salvation. Brethren, I, I wish, I wish we could get this. Jesus came to take away our fears. Of, of all the commands that Jesus said, the most common command, the one he gave the most, is fear not. Do not be afraid. And if Jesus can take away what would, what would bring the greatest fear from the greatest storm, if he would stand with us and not abandon us, but take away the pain and the fear from what we would fear the most, don't you think that Jesus is willing to stand with us when we face such smaller storms today? He still calms the storms. He still stills the seas. If you're full of anxiety today, troubled about the way things are, don't you forget he came to remove our fears. And if he came to take away the greatest fear of that which is to come, don't you think that even today he can take away our smaller fears on the smaller problems we face day by day. Don't live in fear. The love of Jesus is selfless, willing to put our needs before his own. The love of Jesus rejoices in the truth. The love of Jesus, it doesn't take delight in wrong things. It doesn't take delight in sins. Sometimes we think that love and correction are mutually exclusive, but that's not true. And so Jesus would rebuke the, the Pharisees for the hypocrisy. Jesus came into the temple flipping the tables, Casting out the, the, the money collectors. Even that woman in John 8, the woman caught in adultery, he didn't just say, okay, you know, I did, it's not really a big deal. He didn't excuse her sin. No, he didn't condemn her, but he picked her up and he said, go your way, sin no more. You know, sometimes I think we get this idea, to love me is to fully accept me as I am, but that's not what we see in Jesus. Rather, Jesus calls us to him as we are. And out of love, helps mold and shape and transform us into something better, something holier, into more like him. Jesus speaks the truth in love. His is a love that rejoices in the truth. And then Jesus' love, it's a beautiful thought, that there's no limit to his endurance, no end to its trust, no fading of its hope. It is can outlast everything. In fact, when everything has failed, it is the love of Jesus that still stands. And so the love of Jesus is a patient and enduring love that waits for the prodigal to come home. A hope, a love molded by hope, trusting that the heart will change and turn and come back to the Father. The love of Jesus is strong enough to bear the burdens of the sin of the world as he took that on the cross of Calvary. And he didn't take it begrudgingly. He didn't take it with bitterness. can't believe I have to do this for his people. He took those sins and he took them on the cross. No, with the love, with the best of intentions, he wanted to bring these people freedom from their sins to deliver them to glory. And as Paul would say, that there is nothing Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing that shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's so much today about love in the world that can end love. You break someone's feelings, you can, you can end love. You break someone's trust, you can end love. Death seems to separate from love, but that's, that's not the way he loves Listen to what Paul is saying. There is nothing, there is nothing that can separate you from the love of Christ. No sickness or illness or disease. No world crisis. No personal failure, no matter how crushing it is to the soul. No matter how far you can run, you cannot outrun the love of God. There is nothing that will separate us from the love of Christ. John would say, beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. 
In other words, what he's saying is, if, if you recognize just how great, how magnificent, how amazing the love of Jesus really is, that love demands a response. It demands a response of us. So I got two things, just two responses that the love of Jesus, I believe, demands, demands a response of, how we can respond to that love. And here's number one, that we be rooted in love. And Ephesians 3 is where I ask you to open your Bibles. In Ephesians 3, Paul's desire for the brethren at Ephesus is to deepen their understanding of the love of Jesus. And so Ephesians 3 and verse 14, he says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derive its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. You see what he says here? He says, I want you to deepen. I want you to strengthen your understanding of the love of Christ. And he uses this, this great picture in your mind. These words, he says that he has this wide love, a love that's wide enough to include all people, not just the best, not just the few, not just the, the most who know the most, that can do the most, all people. For God so loved the world that what? Whoever believes. There's that old hymn in that Sacred Selections hymn book, whosoever surely meaneth me, even me, even me. His love is for all people, wide enough for all people. And we might say it's deep enough to reach even the worst, which means no matter how bad it is, no matter how deep this sin is, no matter how many times I've committed this sin, this failure, this shame, is not so deep that God cannot still love me. And it's high enough, high enough to reach even the heavens. I'm not sure if by high enough, Paul's just trying to get us to see you can't measure it. There's no boundaries to God's love, but it also kind of paints this picture. He's loving us from here. He's loving us home. In other words, if you've heard the phrase, I'm gonna love you all the way back home. I'm loving you here and the purpose and the aim of my love is that you're going to join me up there. You're going to join me home. Because his love is long enough to last through eternity. There's no cap. I'm going to love you this long. Or I'm going to love you up to this many mistakes, this many sins, this many choices. No. no. How do we sing that about grace? His grace reaches me and will last through eternity. There's no end to his love. The point Paul is saying is that you, you can't put boundaries. You can't measure it. Now here's the thing. Paul is saying, I want you to deep, to root, to ground yourself in the knowledge of the love of God, of how amazing his love is. Here's why. Get the image. Think about roots of a tree or roots of a plant. They go down deep, and the deeper the roots, the stronger the roots. It's not going anywhere. We sang that in our VBS song, firmly planted by the waters, I shall not be moved. So get that imagery, that big tree and its deep roots, and it's firmly grabbed on down to the surface of the foundation. Paul says, I want you to have a deeply rooted knowledge of the love of God because when those winds blow... When the winds of doubt blow against your life, when you start to question, does anyone really love me? Really love me for who I am? Is there anyone who won't turn their back on me and fail me who will keep their word and their promises? Or when the winds of doubt start blowing and I start wondering, am I good enough? Could God still love me after what I've done? After how I failed him? or the winds of the critique of the people in our lives who like nothing better but to point out our faults and our failures and to say, what do you think you're doing? Who do you think you're kidding? Heaven's not for you. And when I stand on the edge of desperation thinking, is there anything worth living for? Is there anything? Is there anything that can save me at this point? Is it all lost? It's all over at this point because of who I am and where I am. To know, to know because I have grounded myself 
His love is different. That you can never run so far. You can never fall so deep that God's love would not reach you. Have you had those times in your life? Maybe you've been betrayed by a loved one. Or maybe you're just facing the reality of your own failure. Boy, like a tempest it blows and you wonder, is it too late? It's all lost. To have that confidence, even here, even this deep, I know he still loves me. He's not given up on me. You know, there's a, a writer who talked about where your foundation is, is set. He was talking in the context of anger, but I just want to share what he writes. He says, if, if you're going to get control of the anger in your life, you must base your identity on Jesus, understanding that he loves you unconditionally, that you are his, and that you are valuable, and that he has a purpose and a plan for your life. If you build your identity on, on anything else, you'll struggle with insecurity your whole life. You can build your identity on your job, but you can lose your job. You can build your identity on how good looking you are, but you may lose those good looks. You can build your identity on being popular, but you're not always going to be popular. If you build your identity on anything that can be taken away from you, you're going to be insecure. But don't you hear that from Paul? I don't want you to root yourself in your strength or in your talents and your wealth. No, if you're going to place your life, if you're going to ground your life in anything, it's going to be on the firm, solid foundation that Jesus loves me. In fact, the secret to that confidence, the secret to that, that deep-rooted confidence is living loved. You know, when Simon had that woman in his house as Jesus is there and the woman is washing his feet with her tears and, and pouring the perfume on his feet and wiping them with her hair, Jesus looks at, at Simon and he says, for this reason I say her sins which are many have been forgiven. Why? Because she loved much. And why did she love much? Because she knew how greatly she was loved. You know, I like the story of a, of a preacher's kid. He was at Bible class one Sunday. And so they were coloring this picture and the teacher came by and the kid did, yeah, you've seen it before, he grabbed like as many crayons as they can cram into one hand and they just kind of go all over the page. And so he was doing that with this picture. And so she came by and she goes, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm coloring the page. She goes, oh, look how sloppy that is. I know your father. Don't you think he's gonna be disappointed? He put those crowns down and he looked at her. He goes, I know my father. He loves me and he's going to love this. There's a genuine confidence of being able to say with clarity, with full assurance, Jesus loves me. This I know. And there is nothing no COVID-19, no global pandemic, no personal failure that may plunge me to my roots. There is nothing that will change that. Ground yourself in that confidence. I think the other response that we need to consider is the need to walk in love. So it's one thing to know that Jesus loves me, and then it's another to take that love, that incredible love, and to, as we might say, to walk it off the page to share it in my life. Paul would say in Ephesians 5, verse 1 and 2, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love. Jesus Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Yeah, that's what John said in 1 John 4, 11. Since God has so loved us, our response is to go and share that love, to walk that love to demonstrate that love and the shared in our lives. And can you imagine the more that we love, 
the more that we become more and more like Jesus. Can you imagine the difference it would make in our lives if we took this love and lived it out? Loving your spouse the way Jesus loves. Oh, you're not going to zing it back when you could. You're not going to be short-tempered. You're patient and you're kind and you're seeking their best always. Can you imagine loving your kids like Jesus loved? Oh, he loved children and he welcomed them in and he had teaching on his lips, but kindness, kindness in his heart. He would not be a cruel and a vindictive father, but a tender and compassionate one. Oh, how much we would need that today. Can you imagine loving your brethren? Can you imagine loving your neighbor? Can you imagine loving those who you completely disagree with right now? Those on the other side of the aisle, those on the other side of whatever's going on today. And your disagreement to love them like Jesus, to give them your time and your thought and your consideration, to put their needs before your own. Well, how could you show such a love? How could you love in such a way? No one loves like that. The secret to a life of love is living loved. I know how greatly I am loved. I've seen faithful love face to face. And little by little, day by day, I share it in my life. The reason we pick some of those words to describe the love of Jesus is because that's exactly how Paul described love in 1 Corinthians 13. That love is patient and is kind. It does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. Love is not irritable or resentful. Love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. And the reason we attribute that to the love of Jesus is because Jesus is all these things. Every, every single thing you could define about agape, God's sacrificial love, you could say of Jesus. And yet, as you look at Ephesians 5, walk in love as Christ loved us. And you try, you try to put yourself in this passage I can't finish it <laughs> because I start by reading, I am patient sometimes and I'm kind sometimes. I do not envy or boast sometimes. I'm not arrogant or rude on occasion. I do not insist on my own way at times. I'm not irritable or resentful. I, you can't get through this section, brethren. Because I can't bear all things. And there are times I don't believe all things as I should. And there are times that my hope wings under the, the winds and the storms of life. And certainly as I get to the end, I, I don't endure all things. And I, I fail. When I try and put myself in this passage and I try and apply the, the love of Christ to myself, it, it just falls flat. As it should. Because on my own, this is impossible. But with Jesus, with Jesus shaping my life, day by day, I can be patient. And with Jesus as my pace setter and my example, today, I can be kind. With Jesus with me, guiding and instructing me, in my heart, if I have his love, I don't need to be envy or boast or arrogant or rude, and I don't have to insist on my own way, not when Jesus' way is my way. Because with Jesus, I can bear all things and believe all things. With Jesus, there's a hope, steadfast and sure, that will not move by the storms of life. With Jesus, whatever comes, I can endure it, because with Jesus, if I am with Jesus, I will never fail. That's the amazing love of Jesus. Jesus, friend of sinners, loved me ere I knew him, drew me with his cords of love, tightly bound me to him. Round my heart still closely twined the ties that none can sever, for I am his and he is mine forever and forever. Jesus, friend of sinners, Crown of thorns you wore for me, bruised for my transgressions, pierced for my iniquities. The wrath of God that I deserved was poured out 
on the innocent. He took my place, my soul to save. Now I am his forever. Jesus, friend of sinners, I love to tell the story. Redeeming love has been my theme and will be when in glory. Not death, not life, nor anything can ever separate me. O oh, love that will not let me go, yes, I am his forever. If there's anything I want you to know about Jesus, it's just how much he loves you. How much he loves me. How much he loves us. To know the love of Jesus We'll stop pursuing the false gold in the world, the fake idols that promise us delivery and victory. We'll pour ourselves into our jobs and our wealth and our strength and our talents to save us. But we'll be satisfied with the God who gave his life for us and to seek our strength and our hope and our victory in him. And while it seems impossible on the screen, day by day, with Jesus and his strength, will show the world this love. Before I speak tomorrow, I'm going to think about speaking in love like Jesus would speak. Before I post on Facebook, taking a stance on either side of any argument that could be shared, I'm going to think about what Jesus would post and what this will reflect about the love of Jesus and how others will see that. Things may be bad at home right now. But rather than digging in my heels and making things worse, I'm going to think about how Jesus would enter into my home and handle this conflict, and I'm going to show some love today, some love the way that Jesus would love. Because, brethren, if there's anything our world needs right now, it's to dig deep, to dig deep, and to firmly root ourselves in the fact Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. I love you, and I'm thankful for you. Have a wonderful Sunday.